founder of the Harlem Success Academy say parents are literally fleeing their zone schools as they buy for seats in charter schools. Parents are dissatisfied with the schools in their communities and they're looking elsewhere. And that dissatisfaction brought as many as 5,000 parents to the armory in Washington Heights by possibly the largest charter school lottery in the state. The notion that one has to get lucky to get a first-rate free public education, it shouldn't be that way. With just 475 seats up for grabs and more than 3,000 applicants, parents certainly know what's at stake. Throughout our history, what we've seen is dramatic achievement gaps between African-American Latino students on the one hand and white students on the other. The average black 12th grader is performing about as well as the average white 8th grader, meaning that there is a four-year gap in achievement by the time students are graduating from high school. These statistics are staggering. It's stunning. You know, to think that 58% of black fourth graders are functionally illiterate. The frustrating thing for me, frankly, is that we've proven we can do it. Uh, we have proven in, in every city and every community around the country that any child can learn at the highest imaginable levels. We see kids coming from the most challenging of circumstances that are fortunate enough to get into a good school, be it a private school, a good public school, a good public charter school, that it just excel. Was there a lot of rain? And so there really can't be any more excuses. So the question is, is why don't we have more of them? So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped bosses of Colorado. So <laughs> not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring. When we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing the hymns of the Old Negro Spiritual. My name is Shauna Rochefort. I love working with children. That's my heart's desire. I'm continuing to go to school so that I can become a teacher full time. That's just what I love to do. It comes natural for me. I love children and I love watching them develop and grow. My wife Shauna is truly a godsend. When I come home and I see how much progress she's made with these children academically, it's like they learned something new today. Yeah, that was nice. Now let's do our words. No, well, Eric is gonna do his words, right, Eric? I need rest first. You need to rest for a minute? Okay, so you can rest for a minute. Come. Come, let's sit on this. You're gonna rest for one minute? I'm looking for a school where the teachers are excited about teaching. I'm looking for a school that's going to look at my child and see what his strengths are and his weaknesses and teach him according to those strengths and those weaknesses. Okay. 
What are you gonna do with all the stuff? You going from activity to activity. I'm doing something over there. Come in now, clean this up first. Being a single mom okay. is very, very hard. You have to do everything. You know, in the morning time, I have to get up, I have to get my son dressed, box, get him out the right? door. I'm gonna squish it in the box. Always have to be concerned when I'm at work with meetings to end early because I have to get home. It's fun because you become very close with the child, but it's a lot of work. I think that parenting is a two-part job. <laughs> it's your version. Anymore, I want you back. Oh, baby, give me one more chance. African American and Latino students are lagging behind white classmates in one subject after another. An achievement gap that, by one estimate, costs us hundreds of billions of dollars in wages that will not be earned, jobs that will not be done, and purchases that will not be made. There is a tremendous academic need here in Harlem. There are 23 zone schools. 19 of them have fewer than 50% of the kids reading at grade level. So the overwhelming majority of schools are abysmal academic failures. The charter schools are essentially uh, an option uh, where uh, we call them public charter schools because they're schools which are created with public dollars so that uh, they get funded by our state through our city. They're able to hire teachers uh, to exempt from the traditional union strictures on who you can hire, and you are able to create curriculum that you think will best educate young people. Uh, you get to charter for five years. One of the great things about charter schools is that it is totally accountable. If you don't run a decent school, you will not get your charter renewed and essentially your school will be closed. Uh, and we think that's fair, uh, that in the end, if you take money to do this kind of work, you have to deliver for children. Straight line, nice and quiet. Hands on top. Thank you, 100%. Elvis, can you share what you have? All I should be on Elvis. I am a person. My mom is a person, too. That's your brain. I love how you decided to talk about two nouns. I love it. Did you notice he was telling us about some nouns? There is a myth that parents in certain neighborhoods don't really care about education, and I have never believe that to be true, and all of my experience has indicated that that is not the case. If you're writing and you're doing a good job, pat yourself on the back. Kiss your brains for all the hard work that you're doing. The okay. problem in less affluent communities is that parents don't have the choices that middle and upper middle class parents have. They can't buy an apartment in the PS6 zone. They can't move to Westchester. Those are not options. It doesn't mean because they don't have those options that they don't want alternatives. The problem is not the parents. The problem is not the children. The problem is a system that protects academic failure and limits the choices that parents have. Can I stop playing my piano during my homework? Okay, come on, Brink. I got two. Brink, the thing. This is draw a boxes around the rabbit. Boxes. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah, boxes, boxes. My full name is Emilio Francis Johansson. I'm original from Africa, West Africa, the Ivory Coast. I from the band called The Ancestors. We play in a palo. The band was bro broke up. I'm going to secure myself before I get a kid. But God didn't say that. I've been sick. I was sick. 2002, I just have a stroke. So my mind, I think, it's better to get a kid before I die. So 
Christian for me is everything for me. God a gift to me. God gave to me. Que Dieu bénisse pour ce plat pour nous. Que Dieu nous ait donné pour moi et mon enfant. We say thank you to you, Father, for everything you uh, you done for us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Yeah. The last time Christian saw his mom, two years. My wife, she's, she's there now because right now, with my son named Jeff, I just wanted them to come to America to get the education. to make sure to tell you personally the good, the bad, and the ugly about our school design. We don't have any kind of magic formula here. Uh, it's basically establishing a very strong school culture of high expectations. So we have a longer school day, and we have a longer school year, and we're pretty, pretty relentless. What happens if your child doesn't, if you don't show up on time? What do you think we do? What would really crazy people do who are just totally focused on you getting your kid to school. We do wake-up calls. We will wake you up. If you are late consistently, we will do wake-up calls. We're gonna have to work three times as hard. And we do, and we're very, very successful. On our practice exams, 100% of our children ace the exam, 100%. There's no zone school in Harlem that has more than 58% of the children passing the tests. To me, what this suggests is that children are capable of an enormous amount, and the problem with education is not the children, it's the grown-ups. We do not view the tests as the end goal. Our goal for our children is college graduation. We thought that you could improve uh, the uh, education outcomes for the children uh, in Central Harlem, and we were constantly hearing it's not the same kids, and the families are really troubled, and these young people are dealing with so many issues in their life, we really can't expect them to be able to compete with other children who were growing up in better circumstances. We thought that while indeed it was going to be hard for our children, that we could create schools, and we think these schools can be created all over America, uh, where children still learn despite the fact that they're growing up in these troubled neighborhoods and troubled families. Every child can learn. We, as the educators, are there to give them the resources. If they don't make it to college, then the system has failed them, not the other way around. I don't believe that charter schools are the answer to the problem in New York City. I think one of the reasons that African American and Latino ch kids drop out of high school, uh, I think there are a lot of reasons for it, but I would start off by saying that 
the, the poverty rates in this country are mostly Latino and, and, and African Americans. Poverty is a tremendous Im, Im, you know, impediment to, to learning. I, I don't think poverty is the reason for the gap. I think um, if you speak to any parent, they want their child to succeed. In any school that you walk into, there's always going to be a unique set of challenges, whether it's that kids are too poor, whether it's that parents are too rich, whether it's that parents are too involved, not involved enough, you'll always have a challenge. Um, the job of a school is to say, regardless of all those challenges, what can we do to address it? It's quite surprising that you can have these phenomenal high-performing schools on the one hand, and yet on the other hand, you have incredible opposition, even protests, and I think you can boil it down to the fact that excellent public education threatens the not so good or even quite terrible public education that is being offered up. If we in the charter school movement can provide phenomenal education at equal or less than the per pupil funding, why can't these other schools do it? And the reason they can't do it is because they're saddled with the bureaucracy of management and the bureaucracy of the district and the union contracts and so forth. And so we're a huge threat to this institution that's been around for a long time. Now, I have not had union issues at my school, so I would not say it's impeded me in terms of working effectively with my school community. There are definitely um, pieces of it that affect my decisions on a daily basis. Um, you know, if you were not a successful employee in business, I don't need to write you up and really um, go through the entire process, um, which I have to here. If I see a teacher that is underperforming and um, not using best practices in their classroom and not um, providing a rigorous education, it is a challenge and um, not one that, you know, I think benefits our kids. It is very difficult to um, fire a teacher. We would be very uh, handicapped if we had to take two years to let go a teacher who we thought was less than excellent. Our guest is Randy Weingarten. She is president of New York City's largest teachers union, the United Federation of Teachers. Should teachers be fired if they're not doing a good job? The uh, teachers, I believe that teachers who are not cutting it should um, have a due process procedure. Let's assume the pr due process, but, but should they be fired if they're not doing a good job? I, I do not think the school system should have to have incompetent teachers. Absolutely right. Is this number correct or not? Out of 55,000 tenured teachers, last year only 10 were fired. There are over 800 people who the school system has removed for one reason or another that they have the right to bring charges on and whatever. So when they say 10 people or this or that, I don't know what they're talking about. They have a procedure. Okay, but how many people brought up the charges? But I mean, right. is it true or not true that 10 people were fired last year? I mean, that's a um, no, easy question. It's far more than 10 people. Were fired. Who, there's far more than 10 people. Not who brought were up fired. on charges. Fired. Far more than 10 people okay. who were fired. Well, I think the union is a force in New York City as well it should be. I think that the union is here to stay. I don't think it's going anywhere, and I think to think that you can get rid of it is A, a mistake. Um, uh, frankly, I'm a unionist. My husband ran the largest union in New York City, and um, I believe it's important because I believe by collective bargaining through the union, you get the best deal for everybody. The teacher's union contract is 600 pages in length. It's kind of the governance structure for schools, and it lays out all the things that teachers can't do. It prescribes almost every aspect of schooling. It limits prep time to one 50-minute period per day. We think teachers need three prep periods a day to be 
excellently prepared. That would be a violation of the contract. We also think that we need to be able to work collaboratively with teachers to improve their practice. So I all the time uh, go into classrooms, as do my principals, to watch a teacher teach unannounced. We have an open door policy. That's prohibited in the teacher's union contract. It's very, very hard to run a school where everything is predetermined because what you need to do in order to meet the needs of children is you need to constantly refine your school design and school schedule. If there's a problem today, we can fix it by the end of the day. Oh my gosh! I just sat down, I looked at you, and you were already ready. I love it when that happens. You get a compliment card. So how many cards do we have now, you see like seven. seven. How many cards do we need? We have seven. How many more do we need until we get to have a party? We need five more. For two years, more, right? I taught seven, at eight, PS 121 in the Bronx as a fifth grade teacher. What does an adjective describe, Micah? An adjective describes a noun. His sibling. My experience was incredibly disheartening. Um, most days I felt like I was running <laughs> into a brick wall. My fifth graders were functioning far below grade level. For example, right now in my first grade class, almost all of my students are reading at or above grade level. In my fifth grade classroom, I had the majority of my students not even able to read second grade text. Your only goal as a teacher is to educate the children to the best that you can, but when there's very little support from the administration or your coworkers, it makes it very difficult to do your job. It really doesn't have to be that way. Eva's model when she hired me was that you will spend almost every minute of your day thinking about your scholars and how they can learn more and how they can be more successful. And that's what I do. And that level of hustle and that level of commitment, what we've created, is ultimately the key. Because if you get people to believe that these kids can do it and they, and they deeply care that, that it happens, it can happen. What's at the end of that sentence, Jesse? Eight, eight, eight. In a complete sentence, at the end of the sentence. At the end of the sentence, there is a, a what do you call those things? I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. You need some help? Phone a friend? Angelina, you know what it is? Exclamation point. It's a hard word to say. It's an exclamation point. Say it with me. Exclamation mark. Parents are responding. These charter schools that we have that are overachieving, they have waiting lists, lines, in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And I don't even go to lotteries anymore uh, because they break my heart. A child's destiny should not be, cho uh, uh, should not be determined on the, on the pull of a draw. Of course, the lottery is uh, prescribed by law if demand outpaces supply, you have to do a lottery. You do not have to do a public lottery. We do a public lottery to show that there are thousands and thousands of parents Ooh. who are interested in a phenomenal education for their child. Daddy, let's play. Well, right now, um, Eric is in the lottery for two other schools besides Harlem Success Academy. If he gets in the other two, I would be happy, but I really want to get into Harlem Success Academy. <laughs> what can I do? I just wait for the lotto. I just put everything in the girl's hand. It's um, it's um, gonna, gonna take everything. You know, it's difficult because it's one of the best schools in the area and you really want your child in, but it's not a seat for every child. But I'm hoping that we are picked. I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, the unions are playing to win, and because they don't want to be the face of the opposition to charters as a largely white-dominated leadership organization, and because it would be so obvious that they are protecting the interests of their members and so forth, what they will often do is hire an outside group, like an ACORN, which is a community-based organization, and they'll bus in hired guns, protesters, who will protest charter schools in general or a particular school. 
and they make a number of arguments about charter schools. They'll say charter schools only succeed because they have small class sizes, even though we have kindergarten classes of 27, 28, 29 children. Or they'll say charter schools don't educate special ed kids. They'll say that if a charter school goes into this building, class size will triple even though these schools in Harlem are incredibly under-enrolled. The struggle is a national struggle. If you talk to charter operators in any city, in any state, you will find that the opposition comes from unions and from Democratic local officials. I'm not against charter schools, but the way that they're using charter schools in this neighborhood, I'm against that. And in my opinion, they're doing it, it's another tool for gentrification. We did a lawsuit because they um, went about it wrong. We like to be involved in what's going on with DOE. We have our PTA president, Brenda yes. E. The charter school will not be inside yes. of PS 190. Academy 2 into the M194 facility. With that, I will give the microphone to Harlem Success Academy 2. We started our first school in August of 2006 uh, because we believe deeply in what children can accomplish. We obviously uh, need a space for our school, um, and that is why we're here. Thank you very much. My name is Brenda A. I am the PTA president of 194, and I'm also a parent. If you mean well, then you would not come into our community and try to divide its neighbors. The PS 194 is here, and we will not, I repeat, we will not give up this fight. Build your own building. Let me say to Miss Eva Markowitz, Miss Markowitz, as I said to you before, folks in Harlem will not let you disrespect them. She's our Obama, okay? She brought change to our kids, okay? My 13-year-old just got put in the eighth grade and my five-year-old is teaching her to read. We're not trying to say your kids can't come here. We're not trying to say we don't want your kids. We're trying to say, tell them to come and talk to her, see what she's doing and bring it to your school and let's work together as a team. Not call each other now. I think that the perception that's been put out there by some people about charter schools is that 
there are just this wave of well-to-do people who are coming into disenfranchised neighborhoods and are kind of taking over the schools, and that's just not the reality. The reality is that these are children from the community. I live three blocks from PS 194. I grew up in this neighborhood, so it's our neighborhood too. I have a problem with 21 charter schools coming up into Harlem. I said 21. I am so tired of being tired of people disrespecting me and my children and my school. This space, this space is for the children that is zoned for the schools. Mr. White, you can go back and tell your bosses that this is not a desert storm. No one is gonna run through here like Storm and Norman. That's not happening. Harlem Success Academy, y'all are not welcome here. We will not welcome you here. We will fight. I will fight until my dying day. I refuse to see y'all in PS 194. It will not happen. It will not happen. I think successful charter schools really are a threat to uh, the, the educational status quo, that they suggest that in order to educate poor kids, we have to do things not a little bit differently, not through some sort of small reforms here and there, but by really remaking um, our whole approach to education. We need space. I'm black, most of y'all are black. We need space so our children, I live in Harlem, Good evening, everyone. For one second, look back in your life from when you was a child. You want your child to make some of the mistakes that you made? Right. It's about your child, it ain't about you. Like the other sister that just left here, I got a child in the third grade in um, the regular public school, and my five-year-old teaches her also how to say the words out. I don't understand what's the big difference about it, but I know it's helping her and it's making her a better person today too. And also it's helping me too. Because I didn't get a chance to finish school. Not saying that I'm illiterate, but I'm happy and I'm proud that somebody cares. And y'all should feel the same way. Like I said, put y'all egos, put it to the side, forget about you. Look at your children. They want to become doctors. They want to become the, maybe the next president or the next mayor of New York City. Parents and children aren't drafted into these charter schools. These charter schools, as, as it stands, do not have enough space to take care of all of the people who want to be there. Yeah, I'm a union man. <laughs> but then at the same time, I want my children to learn. So it's not, I, you, know, you know, me and my family, we're torn. You know, I have my wife, you know, we're both union and, you know, we, 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 we want union. But at the same time, you want your child to go to the best place that's possible. In the classroom that I first taught in, and uh, this was in 1988, I had a classroom that I used to travel to. And along the west wall were four panes of windows, each with about 40 windows in each. And every single one of those <laughs> windows, and I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional, but. <laughs> Everyone was broken. Uh, and over the door, uh, it said, F the BS. It was just a, bro it was a broken place, and it changed my life. I, I committed the next 20 years of my life to eradicating places like that. And I've, I've run into a few kids who survived that place. And the stories that they tell me about what happened to a lot of my kids uh, are not good stories.
I work for MTA, Metropolitan Transit Authority. I'm a bus driver. I enjoy and I don't enjoy my job. Of course, it pays the bills. It provides for my family. It was never what I grew up to wanting to be. My father was a bus driver. My mother, she was in transit also. At one time, I wanted to be an architect. But I never had anything that I, you know, particular um, career that I wanted to um, go into. And so for them to go to college, is the difference between a career and a job. And you can go to college and, and gain a career. You can have a future. And it's not about the money. It's about doing what you enjoy doing. And I believe that college, you know, knowledge is the key. I like college, and it really has helped a lot with my um, economic status and just meeting really brilliant and smart people. Come on. I don't wipe my kisses off. I have my BS in finance. After that, I graduated, and I decided maybe I'll stay in a financial firm, but I do like computers also and take some courses. So I was offered another job, and I went back to Columbia University. And that helped me out a lot, because then I was able to get my next job at MetLife, working as a business analyst. For me to be involved with Greg and Harlem's Success Academy, um, it would be interesting, because Greg is active, and he's somewhat hyper. And he's very intelligent, but he has some focus issues that we've been like dealing with lately. So I think it will be a good program for him to be into. He just needs more structure, and that's really a structured school. In that middle card, you get to your bachelor's and master's. You can get somewhere. My 32 years I've been a year was wonderful. Everything's possible. You can compare America to some country. You can do it. The American dream is so wonderful. In my very living room, right here, a woman whose husband is brilliant on Wall Street stood right here and said, I want you to put my husband's client out of business. Because what they do is they build prisons. They look at the failure rates of black boys in the fourth and fifth grades, and they determine how many prison cells they're going to need in the future. You know, I had heard that. And I thought, oh, this couldn't be. No one is absolutely actually doing that. Well, I was wrong. If you're talking state prisons, it costs on average somewhere between thirty-seven and thirty-nine thousand dollars a year per child. Uh, even in places where people uh, think the education is expensive, and I've heard folk, you know, we, we, it's about uh, $13,000 a year here in New York City, and I've heard people say in other places it's even $18,000 a year, and people complain about that. Uh, it's not half, uh, in most cases, what we're spending on jails and prisons. And when you realize that uh, we lock up people in this country by the millions, uh, this is not a, mi a minor cost uh, to society. It's really a major cost. We're not going that way. What's that, Yankee Stadium, right? So do you know where we're going? House number two. And to keep Which my son involved with two? his father wasn't a hard decision at all, because I feel like me, my father was an alcoholic, and you know he used drugs off and on pretty much all his life. But my sister and I were very involved with our father. I just felt like no child should not be given the opportunity to be with their father. It's house number two the one with the playground, or is house number two the one where we go inside the playroom? There's a playground. OK, so we're not going to house number two, then. We're going to house number one. No! Let me go to house number two. Well, you talk to your dad about that when you see him, and you tell him, OK? You tell him. Listen to me, when we go inside, we're going straight on the line, OK? Uh -huh. so we need you to cooperate. What does cooperate mean? Means do what I say. Good one? Yeah, good one, yep. Gregory. Greg, right, come on, let's go. My name is Gregory Alexander Goodwine Sr. When you go through where you sit, over there, right? 
Go ahead. I can just flash you back to where it began, 1983, right after I turned 16 years old. My cousins and their friends had uh, become thieves, so to speak. They like to go in stores and take stuff. Let's see your left hand, kiddo. Okay. They would show and flash their money and show their new clothes and everything that they were doing. And it just attracted me. It went from stealing to selling drugs. I was thinking that I would become the kingpin guy, the guy with all the money, and then I could pull out. But it never, it never surfaced. It never surfaced. It just took me so long to realize that the decisions and the choices that I made coming up were the wrong things, you know? They were the wrong things. And I, I don't regret it. And the reason that I don't regret it is because I have something and someone to give something to, to forewarn them, don't think like I thought. Well, we've got a, a, a culture in education, uh, and it goes throughout. It's, it's not, you know, people get to unions, but it's the education schools, it's the uh, sort of large cities and small towns where we have uh, created a system that we, uh, you know, created sometime between World War I and World War II. And that system essentially has not changed. It's like we think we created the perfect thing and we haven't touched it. You know, I think people are, are irrationally wed to an educational system, to the way we deliver this system that is decades old. And people are like, hey, I, I went to schools like this. I went to that model. And so we get very wed to that, as opposed to thinking like we do in other sectors, from the tech sector, from the biological and medical sciences. We, we, we think creatively, in many ways, reinvent uh, the way we do things to meet the demands of the time. But we just haven't been doing that in education, where it gets stuck in these ruts that are ridiculous if you sort of pull them out. Like, it's ridiculous, something we all assume, that in, in public education, time should be the constant and achievement should be the variable. Well, you, what you see in a lot of these schools is they're, they're saying, that's crazy. Let's make time the variable and achievement the constant. And so we're going to have kids go to school for a longer school day if necessary. And suddenly they're seeing that they're getting a lot of results for something simple like that. I think having flexibility is one of the great advantages of a charter school. I think it's something it should be worked on, negotiated with, with the union. If you know that, if you begin to find out that a kid having a full day school plus extra, extra help um, on Saturday, if that works, then we've got to figure out a way to work, make it work for all kids. It's a massive job, and I think that it's, uh, I think any kind of change, you have to negotiate it as part of the contract. The contracts were negotiated throughout the years. Um, you have to renegotiate contracts. You can't just say, I'm not going to pay any attention to this contract. <laughs> 
what's so easy to say, and I'm a Democrat, and so easy for us to say, they just need more money. I mean, that is that's the, the most wrong-headed way of thinking about education these days. It's not just about more money. It's about a result. It's about achievement. It's about how we're delivering that education and the choices we're giving uh, our parents. And if people say it's just about money, I can tell schools that uh, are, are have a, a lavish money uh, uh, in suburban areas that are not achieving as much as struggling inner city schools who, who have new delivery systems and new ways and innovative ways of organizing themselves that are performing much, much better. Leaving a failing school as we had so long in New York City, schools with 30 percent, 28 percent graduation rates, it's unthinkable. So we've shut down over the past seven years, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 or 60 large failing high schools. The controversy comes about because of adult politics and because uh, adults are affected by it. When I close down a large high school, not everybody in that high school is able to find another uh, job immediately, and that causes concern. But we don't view the school system as a job system. We view the school system as an education system for our children. I think it's hard for an outsider to understand the influence of the teachers' union on democratic politics. You can't get elected in New York City without the support of the teachers' union. They spent more money lobbying Albany than any other industry. They also use tactics that are quite thuggish. So if you cross them, it will not be a very pleasant experience. I've certainly experienced that uh, personally. I think if you ask any Democratic elected official who has ever done something that the teachers' union doesn't like, they come after you. They told me they will put me six feet under. It's really godfather-like tactics that are being used. If you were a politician who decides that we should look at the contract, that's considered the third rail. You're not supposed to speak about the contract. The only people who can speak about the contract is the leadership of the teachers' union. And next, our former colleague, the former chair of the Education Committee, Eva Moskowitz. Welcome, Eva. Good afternoon, Councilmember Jackson, chair of the committee, and all of the members. There are currently 23 public charter schools in Harlem, and they are transforming public education. For the first time, Harlem parents have meaningful choices. Now, however, a backlash is taking place. There is, I would argue, a union political educational complex that is trying to halt the progress and put the interests of adults above the interests of children. Chancellor Klein decided to shut down two schools that are failing students. These schools deserve to be shut down. At PS 241, only 10 percent of eighth graders passed the reading test in 2008. At PS 194, only 37 percent of fifth graders passed the reading test in 2008. These zone schools are destroying the lives of children. Now Chancellor Klein has backed off from the plan to shut down those failed schools. This happened because the United Federation of Teachers brought a suit to prevent these failed Harlem zone schools from being shut down. Councilmember Jackson, you and I both live in Harlem. We don't send our children to schools like this. Let's be honest, no one on this committee would send their child to a school where only 10 percent of the students read on grade level. It is wrong to keep open failed schools to which we wouldn't send our own children. President Obama says we need more public charter schools, but from our local government, we are hearing the opposite. It's let's slow down this change. Let's slow down parent choice. Every year we wait to offer parents the choices they deserve is a year in which children's futures are destroyed. We cannot wait. We have waited too long. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Eva, coming in on behalf of the Success Charter Network. Okay. Councilmember Lou Fidler. I, I, I just want to say that I found one thing particular. I mean, I disagree with you in general, but I found particularly objectionable your demonization of the teachers in the city and their union. And I think that, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, it strikes me that they are of the same mind as many members of this committee are, which is that if a public school is failing, it ought to be fixed. PS 194 was failing when I was a kid. And we've had reform after reform after reform after reform. And I, I think parents deserve in real time 
something better. You know, if you've got a kindergartner, you can't wait five years. Your kid will already have not learned to read. You're comparing apples to bananas if you're going to look at the factors that are most important in a quality education and compare them. I didn't ask why your class sizes but were smaller. Why matters? I just aspire to having my class size is smaller too. Okay, well, you wouldn't like our schools very much because our class size is very big. In kindergarten, we have about 27 kids in kindergarten. All right, so your class sizes are higher than the average. Correct. How about special ed and IEPs? We have higher than the zone schools that we're co-located with. We have about 18% on average of the four schools. I have one school where it's higher, it's about 23%, and at my other schools, it's about 16%. Oh, let me turn to my colleague, Maria Del Carmen Royo of the Bronx. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You, in your testimony, said, Councilmember Jackson, we both live in Harlem. I, for the record, do you live in Harlem? Uh, I grew up in Harlem, and I live in Harlem. You live in Harlem currently? I do. Would you share with us a street? I, I have three young children, so I would prefer not to. Are you questioning uh, that I'm telling the truth? Yeah, um, <laughs> I am. OK, so I, I'm going to go no, on to the second, next question. Okay. That's a little let, let me just say, offensive. I, I'm let happy me just to say. take, take an offense. Oath. It's I'm okay. happy to take an oath problem. as to where it's, I live. Wait, Mr. Chair. I can handle this. Mr. Chair. One second, I'll, I'll please. Move, one second. To the next one, question. one second. Um, I, I know for a fact that Eva lives in Harlem, but clearly I, do, I represent part of Harlem, but I live in Washington Heights. So that, I'm not questioning where you are. No, I know that. Okay. I understand, but go ahead. So the, your statement about the schools deserving to be shut down, I, I think you represent, for me, the one thing that I have a great deal of concern about charter schools. You come in here and say they deserve to be closed down, and then we, those of us who remain in this body have to navigate the conflict that comes out of the arrogance that comes when you make a statement like that. I, I, I appreciate, and if, um, if I have come off as arrogant, then I you apologize, have. but I would like an opportunity um, to explain what I think you are mistaking, because I, I don't think it's arrogance, I actually think it is my own personal experience with District 5 schools. I went to them as a child. I had to figure out what to do as a mother. And it is my experience of the pain of wanting your kids to get a phenomenal education and being told it's that zone school or nothing. That's what you've been assigned to, and you better like it or you're done. And I think that that is an experience as a parent that is just awful. You bring these kids into the world, it's your obligation to do right by them. I get emotional about what these children can have. When you watch these parents protesting, you want to grab them and say, do you remember when you were a child and you wanted to be an astronaut or a scientist or president of the United States and you couldn't because no one taught you which direction to go to get there. So wanting to be an astronaut seemed as far away as the moon, which um, it's really not that far, but no one told you that. And you just don't want to see anyone else miss out just because no one told them they can have it. Oh, but my, but but I know. She said, she said she want me, her, her daughter, I'm her daughter, but, but she said, she want her daughter to make the best school for me. And that's, and that's all she know. 
Mama, Pin. Pin. What about the two plus three? Two plus. That's what we add. Two plus two. That's a two right there. Three right there. How two. much together? And that's what we take three. How much? Um. T together. One two. You can tell them. It's five fingers. Why you can't say five? Five. You have to count. Five. The two means. I said two plus three. How much? How many? Two. Two means add three. How much? You don't look at it. It's this you look. Two plus three. How much? Two. Two means three. How many you got? How many fingers you got right now? Four. What about this? Two plus three. How much? Five. That's it. It's five, man. Right? Why are you crying for? Now we are together. Three plus three. Three plus three equals six. Okay. Very good. Okay. So what are you gonna do? We finish? Yeah, we relax. You want to relax? <laughs> You want to relax? Okay, okay. I was listening to the radio one day and they were talking about education for kids and they were talking about Harlem success and they were breaking down what the school stands for and they instill in those kids from the beginning that my goal is to become a college graduate. I'm 42 years old and I've never in my entire 42 years ever had anybody tell me that my goal is to help you become a college graduate. I think that if I would have had that, that type of setting, that type of initiative broadly right in front of you like that, I think that, I think that would have made a whole big, a big difference in my life. I think, I think that it would have. He was accused of a crime um, in Yonkers, New York, that um, we don't believe that he actually committed and because he's a three-time felon, and that's the, the rule in New York, he had, you know, a sentence of 25 to life. I grew up around a lot of people who were selling drugs, a lot of people who were street. Yonkers is really street and really kind of like what we call gangster. And a lot of the young men, honestly, like that I went with to school with, and I know in Yonkers, I can count on my hands the ones that are really doing well. A lot of people need to understand. They say, well, it's good a child is street smart, but the streets have never helped anyone. Being street smart has never helped anyone. It's got them nowhere, prison. Greg's amazing. Greg is something else. 
You know, he's something else. I just wish that he didn't have to go through this. What can I do? I can't tell my wife no more. Because it's not just about me or her. It's about us and it's about my son. You know, as bad as I don't want him to have to go through this, but I can't just leave him because I feel responsible. If something goes wrong, I gotta live with it. If something goes wrong, if he doesn't have, if he doesn't have what I didn't have, he could be susceptible to this. My wife is a great wife, but my mother was a great mother. One way, one way, you have to be, you have to train them. One way is okay. One way is like if you do, you give to them too much uh, stress, it's, it's a no good too. I don't want to take the example for my father, but uh, he made us stronger. I got to pass in this class because my father is there by right there, so I don't want to fail. So Christian and I, we do the homework together. He really good. You write the noun very nicely. The teacher says he doesn't even work with it. I'm so happy to see him. He's a smart kid. In the class, he's, uh, he's a number one, number two there in his class. He's doing good. And uh, I pray God for this, uh, for Harlem Academy to, uh, to call him. We have families who are in very challenging circumstances, and we do our best to support them. But the main thing we do is educate the children, no matter what the circumstance is. They still have to learn how to read and write, and so we need to provide more love at the school. We need to make focus as easy as possible for the child. Does it make it more difficult? Of course it does. Can children be distracted when they've had trauma in their lives? Absolutely, but we can't change the hand that the child was dealt or that we have been dealt as a school. We get that child and we get emotionally attached to that child and it's our job to educate that kid no matter what. Come on, sit up, sit up so I can see how it looks. Barack Obama. Okay. Barack Obama. Ma has socks on and shoes on and pants on. Okay, okay, so we'll put that on. Come here. Mm -hmm. Barack Obama has those black shoes, shiny shoes. Does he? Mm-hmm. You seen them with them on? Yeah, I saw them. <laughs> what are you doing? Are you doing some work? I am Barack Obama. Why do you think that? You look a little bit like him in that suit. No, I feel a lot like him. Okay. <laughs> we need to go because it's 4 o'clock, okay? Thank you, God, to take me to school. Say. Please, Father. Please, Father, to take me to school. You want to do this too? When we come back again. We'll come back again, yeah, okay. Okay. Flip up. Yeah. All right. Ready to go? Yep.
schools, parochial schools, the zone schools, every single option. Thank you. Yeah, I guess you see you probably have to move that way. Parents, they got everybody in Harlem here tonight. So to me, what we should keep doing is grow the options and let the parents fall with their feet. Good evening. My name is Eva Moskowitz, and I am the founder of the Harlem Success Academies. Welcome to our annual lottery. I know this is the moment you've all been uh, waiting for. It's my great pleasure to introduce Jim Manley, the principal of Harlem Success Academy 2, or as we like to say, the Deuce and his faculty. Good evening, everyone. I have a very enthusiastic staff, as you can see. And we're really, really excited. We have a lot of names to read, which is the good news, because that's lots of people getting into our school. So we're really excited. Thank you for coming out tonight. And here we go. And if I mispronounce names, I make one promise to you. I may get it wrong tonight, but I will know their name by the end of the year. I give you that promise. So here we go. Isaiah Durandis. Sean Korazaka. Fanta Cisse, Nawa Karamoko, Willie Guerrero, James Garcia, Nagashe Traore, Mohammed Mbai, Samuel Ayer, Bakar Berry, Bubakar Toure, Rosalie Gonzalez, Anna Diaz, Alex Valero, Suleiman Tassou, Brandon Tassou,
I know there are other good schools out there and it's not the end. We can still apply again for first grade. This is disappointment, that's all. You can see uh, a lot of hope in a lot of parents' eyes. People just looking up at the screen every time they said there was another group of numbers getting called. You're looking at the screen attentively. I knew that my chances were against me, but I was just hoping that a little bit of luck, you know, God's blessings upon us. No, I had to apply only for one, one school that I, I let to say. So, no, I just apply for this. I expect my son to be called and they didn't call him. So I just, I got disappointed, that's it. I applied to, I think it's about, I would say maybe 10 or 15 schools. No, he didn't win. Um, he didn't win any of the lotteries. He didn't win any of them. Look, I have bold dreams for my country, and I know we can achieve them. So for me, it's very simply that every parent should have a menu of options to decide what's best for their child, where they could send their kids to a school model that focuses on this or focuses on that, but that they can choose schools of excellence. How long will it take to get there? I really believe that we are approaching a time in America where we're going to hit a tipping point, uh, where the majority of our children, and then soon, hopefully quickly more, go to schools of excellence in the next five to 10 years. There's great hope for the education system. I think the discussion today is entirely different from what it was seven years ago when I started in New York. City. I see the President of the United States now talking about these issues at the national level and saying the kinds of things that I think education reformers have been talking about for years. We should make every politician say education is the most important aspect of the future of our cities and our towns and our country. If folk really pushed the leadership to do that across this country, and if every one of us wrote and said, look, this is your job, I demand that you take a stand on education, we would make this a better country for all of our children, which is, I think, what we all want.
go together in line with our heads so looking fine in our prime can we all go Together with my